Hello, parents. Looking at current affairs for 9th August, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 11. We'll look at them in detail. The first one, Shia board moves mosque at a reasonable distance. So this is regarding Uttar Pradesh Shia Central Works Board. So it has given its viewpoint before the Supreme Court in this Ram Janm Bhumi Babri Masjid title dispute case. It's a 70 year old case and this is a civil case. There's another case going on which is the criminal case on demolition of Babri Masjid. That is a separate case and this is the case on the property, the title dispute. So Ram Janm Bhumi Babri Masjid title dispute case is a 70 year old case and presently before the Supreme Court and the hearing would begin. So the Uttar Pradesh Shia Central Works Board has stated that the Uttar Pradesh Sunni Central Works Board, the two communities amongst Muslims, Sunni and Shia. So actually the Sunni Central Works Board has been called the owner of this Babri Masjid as such, having the authority of maintaining this Babri Masjid as such. But the Shia Central Works Board claims no, they are the right authority because they say this 15th century Babri Masjid was built by Mir Baki. So Mir Baki was a noble of Babur, the Mughal Emperor Babur. So of course Babri Masjid is named after Mughal Emperor Babur. But Mir Baki was a Shia. So this was built by him, so it should come under Shia Central Work Board is what is their claim. While the Sunni Central Work Board has been given, officially given the authority by the Supreme Court also. It was also a dispute before the courts and the court has clearly stated that Sunni Central Work Board has having the authority because the masjid was built by Babur and Babur was a Sunni. So now the two boards actually have differing viewpoints. The Shia Central Work Board has put its viewpoints before the Supreme Court and it has stated that actually the Babri Masjid dispute should be settled by having a masjid built but at a distance away from the site, the disputed site. So this is what they are proposing because they say that if the two religious places are close to each other then the loudspeakers would also clash prayers would clash so that would result in communal acrimony means it would result in fights so for that reason they say that the masjid should be built in a muslim dominated area in a at a reasonable distance from this most revered place of birth of Mariyada Purushottam Sri Ram. So this is a statement made by Uttar Pradesh Shia Central Work Board. They claim that Sunni Central Work Board is actually uh, com uh, comprising of hardline fanatics and non-believers and they do not want an amicable solution with the Hindu community. So this is what the Shia Central Work Board is proposing as such here. Also, you should know that this title dispute has been adjudicated on by Lucknow Bench of Allahabad High Court and it gave its order in September 10, 2010. So you can see this was its ruling. This is the Babri Masjid. So it has three domes. This is a central dome. So the history of it too we will see first. Then we will come to the 2010 judgment. So this is the 16th century Babri Masjid in Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh. It was brought down on December 6, 1992 through riots, through car sevaks, which resulted in riots throughout the country. So the initiation, you can see the mosque was built and named after Baba, the first Mughal emperor of India. Also, this is a dispute whether this was originally a temple and converted into a mosque, but there is no clear evidence on this too, but there are such claims as well. So this was a case that many temples were converted into mosques. So this did happen. So this is one thing. Then 1949, the dispute started when Hindu groups put in Lord Ram's temple, uh, idol inside the central dome, be below the central dome, inside the mosque. And it was claimed that it has miraculously appeared and the dispute started. So this after that, the government locked the Babri Masjid and this became a disputed site. So this idol is also called Ram Lalla. So this is also one of the entity in this dispute. The Allahabad High Court judgment divides the title actually into three parts. So Ram Lalla is one of the entity to whom this land is to be allocated. So this was in 1949. Then in 1984, VHP, Vishwa Hindu Parishad, spearheaded a movement to construct a temple at this site. Because this particular site of Babri Masjid is specifically said to be the spot of birthplace of Lord Ram. So this is a claim being made and there was a movement initiated to build a temple here. And in 1992, finally, Hindu car sevaks, around 1 lakh car sevaks, 
gathered here and they brought down the mosques and after the mosque was raised riots broke out in many parts of the country then in 2002 again the hindu karsevaks when they were returning from ayodhya they were killed in godhra and this godhra uh, you know train burning incident resulted in riots in gujarat in which again thousands of people were killed in 2009 this liberan commission report on babri masjid demolition came forth and it put the blame on top bjp leaders including alke advani who were present here in 1992 at this site and it is said they instigated the car sevaks to raise down the mosque so they are accused here in this criminal case which is going on before the supreme court this is a different case in which bjp leaders are also accused then after that in 2010 we saw the allahabad high court gave its judgment in the title dispute case the civil side the, the land dispute case and then in 2011 actually the supreme court has suspended this allahabad high court ruling in which the site has been split equally as such amongst the three entities we'll see the details regarding that too so this is the allahabad high court judgment which has presently has been set aside by the supreme court and supreme court latest it has said that this dispute has to be amicably resolved by the two entities both sides coming together and resolving this dispute so this you can see allahabad high court called for trifurcation of this property the disputed property be trifurcated amongst the three players so the supreme court has stayed the order this we have already saw so here you can see the first entity is ram lalla the idol which was placed below the central dome here then second is ram chabutra sita ki rasoi so this region is called ram chabutra then this is the region sita ki rasoi and also nimrohi akhara so this is the nimrohi akhara is the grouping so this ram chabutra and sita ki rasoi go to the nimroha akha, nimrohi akhara which is a group which will be one entity getting one part of the region and then the remaining property should go to sunni central law court so this was the ruling of allahabad high court that how this place can be trifurcated and dispute be resolved so here you can see the said ram lalla is kept here so this is the base shown of this entire site so ram lalla is inside below this central law this is the disputed territory you can see in ayodhya in uttar pradesh and here is the region shown so you can see disputed land is of 2.77 acres in ayodhya in uttar pradesh so this disputed land is shown here so this is the disputed land but adjacent area around this means that is 67 acre property is also under the control of the central government so this is the whole region then the next news item is Kerala Haryana top sanitation survey so this is regarding the sanitation survey which was conducted by quality council of india in the months may and june 2017 it covered around 4626 villages across all states and union territories in the country and it found that 62.45 percentage of households in the country have access to toilets amongst the surveyed villages so this is the thing and also it said that 91.29% of the people who had access to toilet also used it so this is showing a change in the sanitation behavior too because earlier it was has been seen that though toilets are there but people are not using it people are still undertake uh, you know have performing open defecation so this is there also the northeastern states like sikkim manipur and nagaland they are the top performers with 95% of rural households covered by toilets also himalayan states himachal pradesh and uttarakhand have over 90% toilets in rural areas the least performing states are uttar pradesh bihar these are the worst performing states along with jharkhand so here only 30% of the rural households in bihar and in up around 37% of rural households have access to toilets so this is there also gujarat the rural sanitation is 85% so and the southern states like kerala tamil nadu are also good performers with 79% of rural households in having you know access to toilets in tamil nadu puducherry is also scoring poorly only 43% of the households had in rural areas had access to toilets then apart from this other things which the minister for drinking water and sanitation has stated is that swachh bharat mission is actually going to complete 3 years 
on 2nd October 2017. That was the date on which this mission was launched three years ago. And also on the 70th Independence Day, the minister has ministry has plans to celebrate freedom from open defecation week. So this is one aspect. Also with respect to Ganga River cleaning, the sanitation aspect, it has been announced that Ganga grams would be declared. So this is part of the Namami Gange program that Ganga grams or you know ideal model Ganga villages would be announced. So this will, these have been uh, you know selected and will be announced as such in Allahabad district and also in Bihar means in Uttar Pradesh as well as in Bihar, Jharkhand and Uttarakhand as well. So these are Ganga grams model Ganga villages. This is part of the initiative also. And also another thing which has been highlighted is that now in 2016 November actually the it was announced that every ministry means all 77 central ministries have been allocated money for Swaj Bharat mission. So it's Swaj Bharat mission is not the mission of only drinking ministry of drinking water and sanitation but of every ministry. So all 77 ministries together have a sum of 12,000 crore for this mission and the minister for drinking water and sanitation is saying that every ministry has to pitch in for this initiative. So this is also an initiative which was taken. We will see in detail too here. So here you can see the details about this present surveys shown that how in this uh, you know, rural sanitation how have various states fed. So you can see Kerala, Haryana, Sikkim, Manipur. These are the states you can see in green at the top. So overall toilet coverage in percentage is 80 to 100 percent. Then in yellow are states with 45 to 80 percent rural sanitation toilet coverage. And then in red are the states with less than 45 percent of toilet coverage in which the Union Territory Puducherry also lies. You can see Jammu and Kashmir, Orisha, UP, Bihar and Jharkhand. So these are the states here. And overall also you can see the toilet coverage status in the country. So this has also increased over the years. You can see from 38.7% coverage to 49.3%. And presently this survey says that 62.45% of rural households have, of households in the country have toilets. So this is there. So you can see many open defecation free villages have also been declared. 2,20,000 such villages. Open defecation free villages in Namimi Gange program are also there. So this and then open defecation free districts have also been announced. Open defecation free gram panchayats as such and this is the detail. And this is what we discussed that number of people who had toilets and used them was 91.29%. So a major chunk of them used toilets when they have access to one. Then this again is the coverage state-wise performance is shown that coverage and the usage. How many uh, you know, rural areas have toilets and how much, how, how much of it is used. Here are the better performing states and these are least performing states. Then this is regarding the initiative taken to bring toilets in rural areas and how the percentage increase has taken place over the years like in from 2012 to 2016 you can see home without toilets have reduced even in urban areas actually they have increased toilets with no water supply is another concern though there are toilets but when if there is no water supply then they cannot be used so you can see no water supply no drainage system are concerns in some regions which were highlighted here in this national sample survey office survey so this is an earlier survey which was undertaken and this is the 2016 data being shown comparing it with 2012 data. Then looking at this Swach, Swachta mission or actually this is regarding the initiative which was taken in which every ministry has been given budget allocation. You can see separate budget allocation has been made under the Swach Bharat mission to all ministries, all central government ministries. So this is there, this Swachta action plan has also been initiated for the next two years. So, this is the development which has taken place. Swatch village index to assess performance of states on various parameters of how solid waste management takes place, how, you know, public places, how clean are they, so, the, you know, garbage in public places and all that. These are the parameters of cause and toilets based on which the Swatch village index has also been developed. So, this is there. Then, the Namami Gange Ganga Gram, Gram Ganga projects, these are also mentioned here, you can see. So these 
Ganga Gram or model Ganga villages. These have been announced under the Namami Gange program. The program which has been initiated by the NDA government. It's a flagship program to clean river Ganga. It has made major initiatives under it like you know, sewage treatment plants, ensuring that effluents which flow into Ganga are actually treated and sewage treatment plant before being you know, drained into river Ganga and also beautification of ghats cleaning the river Ganga. So initiatives are taken and these model ideal villages along river Ganga will be developed. So these model villages are being planned. So you can see there are 65 villages which have been adopted by 13 IITs to develop as model villages. So this is the first step being undertaken and now further the villages, model villages are being announced too as we saw in the news presently. That these are proposed to be announced in UP, Bihar, Uttarakhand as such. And then there is also Jharkhand which will be developed as a model state for rural sanitation program. The UNDP, United Nations Development Program is, is, uh, is you know, initi has taken this initiative and is the executing agency for this program, rural sanitation program to develop Jharkhand as a model state. Then next is Rahul deliberately avoided SPG, Rajnath. So Home Minister Rajnath Singh is saying that Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi has violated security protocol many times in India and abroad. So actually he's talking about SGP. So SGP is this special protection group. So this special protection group was formed in the 1980s to provide protection to the Prime Minister and his family and also to former Prime Ministers and their families. So under this initiative, Rahul Gandhi is also eligible for protection, but then the, the person as such has the right to voluntarily give up this SGP security. So, but since recently we saw a stone throwing incident on Rahul Gandhi's car. So this has resulted in furor, furor in the parliament and the Home Minister Rajnath Singh is saying that he has violated the security protocol. Though it is clearly stated in this in this provision that it is not mandatory that you should have the security protection group all the time. So of course there is this political angle to it which is not important for us. But you should know about special protection group and what is this provision for. There is this act under which it has been formed. Special protection group act. So you can see the prime minister and his immediate you know, former allows any former prime minister and member uh, of his immediate family or that of the sitting prime minister to decline security. So they can decline security too. So this is also a provision. Majorly provided for security of these people. Then next is Justice Deepak Mishra set to become 45th Chief Justice of India. So the Chief Justice of India, how, do, how are Chief Justices of India? I mean CJI is appointed. The present Chief Justice of India, Mr. Kher, is going to retire on 27th August. So after that, he will be succeeded by Justice Deepak Mishra who will become the 45th Chief Justice of India with effect from 28th August. And the appointment has to be approved by the centre. So the file for appointment has been cleared by the center. So the CGI appointment is free of all controversies. The only thing which is done is the senior most judge in the Supreme Court is appointed as the CGI. Though there have been instances when people have been you know, superseded and that has resulted in heartburn and you know political affiliations being looked into. But then the ideal way which the Supreme Court has decided that how CGIs should be appointed. So it is the seniority principle which is applied. So the senior most member becomes the CJ. Mr. Deepak Mishra is presently the senior most judge in the Supreme Court. So he'll become the CJ in he'll have a tenure of 14 months till 2nd October 2018. So the retirement age of judges is fixed as such. So that age of 65 years is when they retire. So this is it. The next is Mehbooba Farooq talk article 35A. So this is regarding Mehbooba Mufti, Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, whose party PPDP, People's Democratic Party is in coalition with BJP and is the ruling party in Jammu and Kashmir. So she is the Jammu and Kashmir Chief Minister. She met with opposition leader, National Conference President, Mr. Farooq Abdullah. So these two leaders met and they spoke about Article 35A of the Indian Constitution. So this actually is a article which provides special status to Jammu and Kashmir as well, apart from Article 370 of course. So this Article 35A, what is it all about? You would see the two leaders decided that this is the red line. So this should not be revoked. So that has been declared by the two parties as such. 
now this article 35a what is it all about we'll see so actually this is under the fundamental rights so this article was inserted into the constitution through a presidential order means it was not passed through the parliament the way uh, you know insertions amendments to the constitution is that so it was only through a presidential order that article 35a was incorporated in 1954 after the 1952 delhi agreement between then jammu and kashmir leader mr omar abdullah and prime minister of then prime minister of india mr jawaharlal nehru so this article 35 a gives special provisions to jammu and kashmir it allows jammu and kashmir to grant special privileges and rights to permanent residents so this resident permanent residents can be declared in jammu and kashmir means land in jammu and kashmir cannot be sold to any outsider so such special privileges are there and of course right to, you know such restrictions cannot be there according to fundamental rights in the constitution but this special provision is made for jammu and kashmir so the jammu and kashmir the, they had this fear that the demographic of the country may change if this article is or this assurance is not provided for so to assure this article 35a was inserted to of course then land as such cannot be sold to any outsider but it's for the entire jammu and kashmir kashmir valley has muslim majority jammu region has hindu population and ladakh region has buddhist population so the entire jammu and kashmir if you look at it it's not a muslim Uh, completely a muslim region as such but then land in the kashmir valley can be brought by hindus to this so there is no restriction as such that they, they cannot buy but of course outside the state outsiders cannot buy so that restriction is there so that is why article 35 now both sides it is an ideological question the central government is talking of repealing and the it's, it becomes a political issue and the leaders here are claiming that this article should not be tinkered with so this is the whole issue which has been generated now so it's also a case in initiated in 2014 before the supreme court on article 35a and the case is regarding that this article actually not having passed through the parliament so if it is not passed through the parliament how can it be an article under the indian constitution so this is the issue then the next news item is supreme court seeks centers reply on plea against special status to jammu and kashmir so this is regarding article 370 of the indian constitution which gives special autonomous status to the state of jammu and kashmir so there is a petition which has been filed in the supreme court questioning this special status so the the fact is that actually under clause 3 of the article 370 it has been mentioned that the president of india would declare whether this article should cease to exist or continue to be operative based on the recommendation of the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir but the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir which was formed to prepare the constitution for jammu and kashmir so the after its job was done in 1956 the constitution of jammu and kashmir was ready so on 26 jan 1957 constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir was dissolved so this after its dissolution now it did not during that time it did not decide whether article 370 should remain or should be dissolved so it did not give its view points on this and it got dissolved without declaring about article 370 so that is why the petitioner is saying that article 370 for this reason should be lapsed should be allowed to lapse automatically so this is the fact and another thing which the uh, which the petitioner put forth is that under article 1 of the indian constitution to it is declared india is that is bharat is a union of states so then special status for jammu and kashmir is going against this article 1 of the constitution the third thing which he speaks of is that instrument of accession which was signed between jammu and kashmir maharaja maharaja hari singh and government of india in 1947 this also did not talk about a constituent assembly or a separate constitution for jammu and kashmir and another thing which it is calling for been quashed by the court as such is the delhi agreement of 1952 which was between then jammu and kashmir leader mr omar abdullah Mr Sheikh Abdullah and Jawaharlal Nehru so this agreement also the petitioner says that court should quash it but actually this was an agreement which brought Jammu and Kashmir closer to the constitutions closer because many provisions of the constitution of India after this agreement became applicable to Jammu and Kashmir as well and of course some concession was also provided to Jammu and Kashmir with respect to article 35a as well so this is the whole issue so the 
here again it is said that since article uh, you know this 1952 agreement gave residuary legislative powers to jammu and kashmir instead of to the state instead of the center then the jammu and kashmir lawmakers are empowered to confer people domicile status so they have special rights and privileges if you are a resident of jammu and kashmir as such so this is again a point which has been raised by the petitioner so the present news this is already there the petition has already been filed these arguments are done present news is only that the based on this petition the supreme court has asked the center to give its response and center has been given four weeks time to reply so this is there of course so therefore will be further news on these two we'll discuss so article 370 of course confers special powers to jammu and kashmir as such but then article 373 is of significance as you can see here the president has to declare whether this article will cease to be operative or shall be operated so president will declare but only after you know after it has taken the recommendation of the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir so this will be necessary it says constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir's recommendation is necessary before the president issues such a notification whether this article ceases to be operative or shall be operated with such modifications and exceptions as well so this is article 373 then next is Sebi Shell Company dictate Jolts, Jolts Market. So this is regarding Sebi Securities and Exchange Board of India. It has declared more than 300 shell companies as such to be suspended from trading. So there will be this graded surveillance me measure would be initiated against them with immediate effect. So these shell companies, alleged shell companies are those companies which Ministry of Corporate Affairs had notified. So this based on the letter around 331 you can see 331 shell companies were identified by the ministry and based on this the SEBI has given this list and placed them under graded surveillance measure. So this graded surveillance measure framework means trading in such firms is allowed only once a month and any upward price movement is not permitted beyond the last traded price. So such restrictions are pushed or put also surveillance deposit, additional surveillance deposit of 200% of the trade value is to be collected from the buyers. And that is retained with the exchanges for a period of 5 months. So such restrictions being put means the shell companies of course the shares would uh, drastically come down. But the question which is being raised is this concept of shell company, that a company is a shell company, is this in itself a violation of any law? No. So this is a point being raised also there are companies which are part of this list like J. Kumar in Infra Projects. They say that we are not a shell company but we have been listed in this. We have all the details and we are initiating legal action now. Also it is stated that if it is a shell company then they should be given a, a chance that you know they can justify whether they are shell companies or not. So whether they are given a hearing or not is also a major issue. And this sudden action, of course, will result in significant erosion of perception and valuation of these companies which have been listed on the stock exchange. So, this is a major issue picked up. So, this is regarding the shell company. So, of course, a shell company is a company which is having no significant assets or operation of itself. So, it's only a company, a cover. So, now the government is alleging that these are shell companies and has declared them so. But whether they have been given the given a chance to prove whether they are shell companies or not give, giving evidences or not is a major issue here. and based on ministry of corporate affairs action sebi has also initiated action so this has rattled the market now so this generally shell companies are developed and you know are started off to cover up illegal action or to even save tax you know save payment in taxes so all these are several reasons but then there can be genuine shell companies too which are opened up just to test a particular field or an area and if it's working then the company can be established as a full-fledged entity means just per se being a shell company a company does not become an illegal entity so that is the argument here then next is startup funding may come under sebi lens another initiative which has been taken by sebi now is regarding startup funding so there are startups actually government of india is also promoting startups we know startup india stand up india 
initiative which has been taken we have discussed in detail about the provisions under it too how it has been further facilitated to encouraging startups even biotech startups have been given longer gestation period also so all those things are there but sebi its concerns are that how do these startups get funds so the funding entities there are angel investors there are venture capitalists and presently there is a new trend of crowd funding so first you should understand all these things so first we we'll look at that then come to the news so traditionally funding how would it take place that you have one particular source of few sources you take loans from banks and you get the fund and you start up your initiative so that is how traditional funding took place but under crowd funding what happens is large group of individuals give small sums of money and this is facilitated through technology through online you know initiatives which have been taken platforms which have been developed so crowd funding sites are there where you can go and contribute to a small amount and large number of people contributing small amount results in a huge collection a crowd fund developed for startups or for any initiative even for social causes as well so this is crowd funding which is the new trend as such because of technology so here these are two things and then another issue another point is regarding angel investors and venture capitalists so angel investors you should know these are investors who invest their own money in startup companies or new initiatives so these are considered as angels you no know? so farishta angel so angel investors investing their money so they help assist smaller companies so they are like angels for them and a venture capitalist also invest money for startups but then this venture capitalist may not himself be of a position to putting in his own money but he can also gather money and put in in a particular new initiative or startup for example so these are venture capitalists too which get money from others and they get a handsome return in in lieu of that even angel investors when they invest they have a particular stake in the company so such things are there so they are given a particular percentage of stake as such so now what is the sebi's concerns as such you can see apart from this one more thing some changes which the sebi has made presently is that angel funds as such they can invest in startups up to 5 years so up to 5 year old startups angel fund can be invested in lock in has been cut to 1 year earlier lock in period was of 3 years now it has been cut to 1 year but number of angel investors in a scheme has been increased earlier there was a restriction of 49 maximum 49 angel investors can be there in a particular initiative but now it has been increased to 200 so 200 people can also help as such and investment can be up to 25% of you know corpus can be abroad then this is regarding the crowd funding and concerns which sebi has so sebi has concerns that there are these electronic platforms where crowd funding takes place so are they violating the provisions because if there are more than 200 investors then such entities should be listed they should be on the stock exchange as such so that is why the news presently is that a committee has been set up on this matter so you can see sebi squares so first it wants to know that who are these people who are running angel networks how do they raise the funds and are they side stepping the rules of public issue you know like on equi of equity and debt as such and also are these platforms acting like quasi stock exchanges so these are the concerns of sebi and the committee which has been set up you can see here so this is a committee on financial and regulatory technologies which is headed by tv mohandas pai former ceo of infosys so this will look into this issue and advise sebi about whether such disruptions such technological disruptions come at a cost to investor protection and market integrity so whether such entities should be allowed to fund you know mushroom or should there will be red flags raised for the sebi to look into these issues so this will be a committee which will look into this matter so here you can see further also it has said that any violation as such which takes place if these are unrecognized stock exchanges and you know they are cons considered so then sebi would cons have cons would constrain be constrained to initiate action against them so here this you can see under the current legal framework as it is stated issue of a share to more than 200 person constitutes a public issue and needs sebi approval so that is what we just saw so earlier the cap was 49 and now it has increased to 200 because of the companies act revised in 2013 then next news item is 
House panel raises concerns over employee future in Air India Pawan Hans. So this is Parliamentary Standing Committee on Transport, Tourism and Culture in the legislature. It has sought details from the center on its disinvestment plan of Air India and Pawan Hans. The concern which is there is regarding employees. The future of these employees in the public sector units after disinvestment. But it is stated the response by the Minister of Civil State for Civil Aviation is that the commitment has been given that employees would be duly honored. Whatever commitments have been done with them would be duly honored during this disinvestment process. So there are around 21,313 employees of Air India, including pilot and maintenance and overhaul personnel as of 2015. This is there. Another entity, Pawan Hans Limited, in which Government of India has 51% stake and remaining 49% stake is in ONGC. Here also, Cabinet approval has been given to sell off the government stake. Both these entities, what would happen to the employees here is the question raised. So, this is regarding Air India. We've already seen it has a huge debt on it. Though in 2015 16, it, it you know, first time ever it uh, had operation pro operating profit of 105 crores. Otherwise, it was continuously in loss. There are various subsidiaries of it too. You see, some are reporting profit, some are loss making. We have been discussing this quite often, entire month of June, July too. So this is regarding Air India. This is regarding Pawan Hans, which was formed in 1985. So this is helicopter services. 49% with ONGC, 51% with Government of India. Here also, this investment would be taking place. So even Pawan Hans was having low profit, but over a period of time, we are seeing that its profits are also increasing. Then next is, Bhe's failure to diversify hit revenue. So this is regarding the CAG report on Bhe. Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited. So it has stated that Bhail faced failed to diversify its business portfolio. So it is basically in the power sector, but there was a sharp slowdown in power sector, which has impacted the company's turnover. So it is stated that the company was having a profit of 7,040 crores in 2011-12, and in 2015-16, this became a loss of 913 crores. So this happened because of power sector slowdown. And though there was this complete strategic plan 2012 to 2017, which was formed for Bhel to have its development taking place in other potential growth areas like transportation, transmission and industrial products, but it failed to diversify and went into losses. So this failure as such is highlighted in the CAG report before the parliament. So this is there. It is said that there were several attempts made to diversify the company's product offerings. So this is the justification given by Ministry of Health, Heavy Industries and Public Enterprises. But then the final result is that it has failed. It says, uh, CAG report says that Bale did not set year-wise milestones for implementation of these strategies and did not achieve any of the strategic plan targets till 2015-16. So there was a huge shortfall. Uh, in achieving these goals and that is why we are seeing a huge loss and this has resulted because government has a stake in bail so government's market share value of the company gone, gone down so my government's stake in bail has also been plummeted significantly in the recent years so this is the CAG report on Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited so this was formed in 1964 to meet the power requirement of the country. So its earnings, you can see it was an earn, profit earning entity since 1971-72 continuously. Till now we are seeing that it has made loss. And it is world's seventh largest manufacturer of power plant equipment then. And it has a Maharatna status. It has been accorded the Maharatna status in India too in 2013. So these Maharatna status are accorded to the significant major profit making PSUs in the country. This is there, and this is regarding the plan strategic plan, also which was initiated. So, focus on non thermal power sector was initiated. It was planned to ensure that 50% of the business is from non power segment in 10 years. Trust was put on transport equipment and defects. Also, there was this 200 crore order from Chhattisgarh Locomotive Work of Indian Railways, which was backed by. And the last news item is. Commerce Ministry begins DGSND shutdown. So this is regarding Directorate General of Supplies and Disposals. So this is more than 100 year old government procurement arm and the Commerce Ministry has now started shutting down this entity because it has initiated E 
procuring platform. So e-market platform that is government e-marketplace gem which has been initiated in 2016. So that is why there is no need for a Directorate General of Supplies and Disposals. So this would be shut down. So the government has now to decide what would happen to the manpower, land and office spaces of this directorate. So this is the news here. So this is regarding government e-marketplace gem. So you can see what it does it provide for. It is real-time dynamic pricing which would be available here because we know that government procurement is also a huge expenditure. So because government also needs to procure a number of entities. So this is a real-time dynamic pricing which it would get facilitated here. It is fully integrated platform from registration to payment. So e-bidding. Is possible here so entities you know when there is a when there is a need for a bidding so there will be an e-bidding electronic bidding entities can bid over here and even based on the least bid reverse auction can also take place then who can bid lower than that too so that is called reverse auction so then there will be no paperwork here even aadhaar based e-signing is facilitated in gem government e marketplace it is transparent efficient time bound payment would also be ensured online through the transaction and complete document management with audit trail would be possible so this is an initiative by the central government to eliminate corruption in government procurement and facilitate this as such so this is the government e marketplace so that is why directorate general of supplies and disposals has to be shut down and this is the initiative taken here so these are the news items thank you